I'm going to begin this morning's uh, message by reading a scripture passage from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. It comes from the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. It's on the handout. So again, you're going to want to have that. Um, there's extra in the back, I think, if you need one. Uh, there's also a passage from Romans chapter 8 that's on there, and I'm not going to be reading immediately from that one. That one we'll get to in the context of my message. Uh, right now, I'm just going to read the passage that comes from uh, Romans chapter 5, where it reads, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proved his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, last week, Tom's message was titled, Expect the Unexpected, and he talked about this idea that there are times in life when we experience certain unfulfilled expectations. Uh, often in our lives, we carry with us a predetermined idea or assumption about someone or something or how we think our life is going to turn out for us. And there are times in our lives when our experience doesn't match up with our expectations. Uh, he talked about John the Baptist and how his understanding of who Jesus was and what he expected Jesus would begin to do at the inauguration of his ministry, that uh, Jesus would begin maybe to move in greater power and authority as he assumed his mission as the Messiah. But instead, Jesus came to the Jordan River at the start of his ministry, not with a sense of authority, nor any kind of inclination that he was now going to supersede John as John had expected, but rather, he came to submit himself to John's baptism in an act of what is essentially repentance from sin, which is not something that John was expecting. What John expected was different than what he experienced, and so there was this expectation gap, which will only get wider for him as time went on. And I want us to spend a little bit more time this morning talking about that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago... I spoke about the individual Samuel from the Old Testament and how he was the last of the judges and one of the early prophets and how he prepared Saul to be the first king of Israel. He was the one who anointed Saul and made him king and used his reputation to promote him among the people and he mentored him and he invested a lot of himself into Saul. Samuel, I'm sure, had expectations about how Saul was going to usher in this new era of leadership for the people of Israel. And I'm sure he had a lot of hope, but his experience fell short of his expectation as Saul's integrity deteriorated and God later rejected Saul as king, sending Samuel into this period of intense mourning. Uh, we all have experienced this expectation gap in different areas of our lives. Um, just yesterday, I got up in the morning to sign up for volunteer service at my son's next gymnastics meet here in Elk Grove. Uh, for those of you whose kids are or have been involved in gymnastics, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the gymnastics center that my son is involved with allows parents to sign up for various responsibilities that are involved when the meet is held here locally in Elk Grove. And for your services, they will subsidize some of the costs of your kids' gymnastics expenses, which can end up being somewhat significant. While my wife wanted me to go, she's not here, is she? <laughs> okay. And she told me that the line would start to form outside the building at 7 in the morning. And then at 7.30, she told me they'll start handing out these numerical tickets 
that you'll take with you and return later in the morning to sign up for, you know, whatever responsibility you want to sign up for, depending on the number that you have. Well, I decided that I really wasn't all that concerned about the priority number of my ticket. You know, I'd just do whatever was left. And so I planned to arrive just minutes before they started handing out the tickets. And uh, so, you know, just before 7.30, I rushed out the door, not really planning or expecting otherwise. Well, I get to the gymnastics center, and the line is already snaking down the building. And I go and I stand in line thinking that I got, okay, maybe 10 minutes before they start handing out the tickets. Well, 7.30 rolls around, and I've been standing there for about 10 minutes, and I'm already starting to freeze because I only brought a sweater, and it's 30-something degrees, and I'm looking at the front of the line, and no one is coming out to hand out tickets. And so I'm, I'm listening to this conversation that's going on between these two women next to me who had brought lawn chairs, and they were wearing these jackets that made it look like they were going to take a trek up Mount Everest. And I hear them mention that, oh, yeah, they said today the tickets are going to be handed out about 8 o'clock. And so I'm thinking to myself, 8 o'clock? That's 30 minutes away, and the blood in my veins are already creeping and crawling to a stop. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Well, obviously, long story short, I made it. I mean, it was freezing cold, and my attitude really sucked in the process uh, because my experience did not match, or I should say my experience did not match what my expectation was, and I got pretty frustrated. But, you know, that illustrates a learning point when we're dealing with the expectation gaps in our lives, and that is when our experience doesn't meet our expectations and we become disappointed or frustrated, it has this tendency to reveal our character. As I was standing in that line at the gymnastics center, the woman that was next to me was actually pretty chatty. And she kept wanting to include me in her conversation with her friend. At least that's the impression that I got. I mean, she would make comments and laugh. And she would look at me. And I don't know, I just got this sense like she was expecting me to start contributing to the conversation. And that's all fine and good and actually pretty kind of her, but on the inside, I was thinking to myself, I really don't want to talk to you right now because I need to focus all of my remaining energy that I have on warm thoughts, <laughs> and I really can't do that if I talk to you. And so what I did, because she kept looking at me, is I took up my phone and kind of crouched down against the wall of the building and completely turned my back to her. And after a while, she got a hint. I got that hint. Now, in reality, as I later on in the afternoon, I came to realize that my frustration wasn't so much with the weather, although that certainly didn't help. My frustration lay more in the fact that someone told me that the tickets were going to be handed out at 7.30, and it didn't happen until 8 o'clock. And that's what I was upset about. Uh, again, when our experience falls short of our expectation, it has this way of revealing our character. Uh, Proverbs 17.3 says, the crucible is for silver. The crucible is where the purity of silver is tested, and the furnace is for gold. The fire is where gold is ultimately tested, but it says that the Lord tests the heart. God is most interested in my heart and in your heart. Now, several weeks ago here at church, uh, we did a group exercise where we were given time to craft a gift that we would then symbolically bring to the baby Jesus in the manger as the wise men did. And as a part of that time, Becky shared a message about how more than any other material gift that we could potentially bring to Jesus, the most important gift that we could give to him is our heart. God is most interested in your heart. And in many ways... Life is the crucible or the furnace where our hearts get tested. How do we respond in life to such things as interruptions or not getting what we want or a health problem or to somebody getting in our way or being disappointed or getting criticized or having to wait? The expectation gap has this way of revealing our character 
but it also presents us with an opportunity for us to grow in our character. But what I want to do this morning is I want to talk more specifically about something in particular with regards to our expectation gaps. Because there is a lot that can be said about opportunities to grow within our expectation gaps, and I actually think you could spend a whole message on that itself. But I want to spend some time talking about times in our lives when our expectation gaps are much wider than just simple inconveniences like having to stand outside in the cold for 30 minutes. For John the Baptist, his expectation gap with regards to Jesus would only grow larger after his baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. Later on in life, he would be thrown into prison. And from prison, he would send a messenger to Jesus to ask him if he was truly the Messiah or whether they should be waiting for someone else. Apparently, Jesus continued to function in a way that was not consistent with John's understanding of the Messiah. And so now here he is, left in prison, imminently awaiting his death and probably wondering on some level whether his own ministry as a forerunner to Jesus had ultimately been in vain. John's expectation gap had grown much wider. And in some ways, it's similar to the unmet expectations that Samuel had over Saul's failure that then threw Samuel into this deep period of mourning. There are times in all of our lives when our expectation gaps are much wider and much more painful for us to bear. Uh, maybe for you, it involves certain expectations like, well, I expected that when we said, till death do us part, that that would be the case. But now here I am, essentially alone, at a time in my life when I never expected to be starting over. Or I expected these people to protect me, but these are the very people who abused me, and now I have difficulty trusting people in my life and developing meaningful relationships. Or I expected that the treatment would work, or that God would miraculously heal that person, but now I'm left to live my life without the presence of this person who's meant so very much to me. Or I expected that if I just worked hard and worked with integrity that I would always have a job. But that certainly hasn't been the case and not because of my lack of integrity in any way but for other reasons and now I'm left wondering if I'm employable and will ever find meaningful work. Or I expected that person to be loyal or trustworthy or faithful to me, but now I feel betrayed and angry and hurt and ashamed. The expectation gaps in our lives can be quite wide and painful, and some of us are living in one of them even now. And although our expectation gaps provide us with an opportunity for growth, I do believe that there are times in our lives when we simply go through seasons of mourning. And I believe that the words of the Apostle Paul in the writings that we read earlier from chapter 5 in his letter to the church at Rome can actually be a source of tremendous comfort to us during those times. But you see, in order to understand Paul's writings, it's important not just to understand the context of his writing, which is important, but it's also important to understand the man, Paul himself. Paul is known to have been a great thinker. And he understood the philosophical thoughts of his day. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is found engaging in these debates at the marketplace in Athens with some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And so Paul understood philosophy. And he would sometimes write from that place. And there is evidence of this uh, throughout his writings, including parts of his letter to the church at Rome. A theologian by the name of David Fredrickson points out that in the ancient Greco-Roman world, the great thinkers of the day understood that there was this connection between suffering and growth of character. And so when Paul says in chapter 5, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, they would have agreed 
with this statement full-heartedly. But then Paul takes this a step further and says that character then produces hope. Now this would have been a confusing statement because the great thinkers of Paul's day felt that hope was actually a sign of weakness. You see, to the philosophical mind of that day, the world was seen to be this cold, hard, and impersonal place. And the glory of an individual, and I think it's still somewhat true today, is to use my own strength and my own reason, which is something that they really loved in that day, to use my own self-sufficiency to rise up above all the sufferings of, the, of this life through the practice of a disciplined mind whereby I refuse to allow circumstances to disturb my serenity and my inner sense of peace. So suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Yes, but character then produces hope? No, absolutely not in the mind of ancient philosophers. Because if you hope, then you're giving up control. Hope is a sign of weakness. In, in fact, some ancients actually wrote that hope is what they called a, a moral disease because it causes what should be a strong, self-sufficient person to begin to trust a power beyond yourself, to no longer be the captain of your own ship and the master of your own fate. It was considered weakness to allow your circumstances to dictate your inner sense of peace. And there was a word that they used to describe people who allowed their circumstances to get the better of them to the point where they actually gave outward expression to their inner lack of peace. And the word that they used to describe what these people did was groaning. Sound familiar? Groaning was the, was the word that they used to describe people who were so weak in character that they actually allowed their circumstances to disturb them. Groaning is what frail and weak people do. Groaning is what people do when they cannot bear what's happened to them, when they can't stand the disappointment that they've encountered in the expectation gaps of their lives. You see, to the ancient thinkers, mastery of the spirit is what mattered. They didn't want to be groaners. They wanted to be masters of the spirit. And they had a word for this as well. And this word will also sound familiar to you. The word that they used for someone who had mastered their spirit was conqueror. Someone who had mastered their spirit through reason and self-sufficiency was known as a conqueror. Seneca, who was a famous Stoic philosopher during the time of Jesus and Paul, wrote, When will it be our privilege to utter the words, I have conquered? Do you ask me whom I have conquered? Not external enemies, but greed, ambition, fear of death, all of these things that could disturb me internally that has conquered the conquerors. To be a conqueror meant to become so self Sufficient, so self-reliant that no circumstance in life is going to disturb you any longer. Then you're a conqueror. The world may be full of pain and suffering and may be chaotic all around you, but I've trained my spirit to no longer be upset by it. That's a conqueror. And to be a conqueror meant that there could be no groaning. Epictetus wrote, No man ever, no good man ever groans. Plutarch wrote, groaning is a sign of weakness. And Cicero wrote, it is a disgrace to groan. That was kind of like a watchword for the ancient thinkers of that day. It was kind of considered to be taboo, except for this man, Paul, who wrote some of the strangest things about groaning and conquering. Paul said that we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Paul says that the physical world is actually groaning. And that's a very interesting statement because you see, in Greek philosophical thought of that day, there was this opposition that existed between spirit and matter. And the approach was to separate spirit from matter. And spirit is what was all important, whereas matter really didn't matter. But the Bible and Paul's writings reflect this idea that the earth does in fact matter very much to God. 
and that one day he will redeem the earth and he will restore it. But until then, creation groans as it, as it is in this state of bondage and decay. But Paul also says, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our own bodies. Paul says that we groan. Paul admits openly that he is a groaner and he is not ashamed of it. Human existence is full of groaning. If not the result of our own sin, then oftentimes the result of a random fallen world. There's the groaning of those who are suffering from financial hardship. The groaning of children who live off the garbage dumps in poverty-stricken countries all around the world. The groaning of those in our society while having enough to eat might, might be dealing with bankruptcy and other financial issues that are breaking down their health and destroying their marriages. There's the groaning of those who suffer violence, the violence of war, the violence of persecution, the violence of abuse. There's the groaning of those who suffer from poor self-image and those who are hounded by a complete sense of failure in their life. There's the groaning of loneliness and bereavement, the groaning of those who've lost loved ones to our great enemy, death, and who feel their absence sometimes like a knife in their stomach or at other times like a dull ache that just lives deep in their heart. There is the groaning of creation and the groaning of the creature and we would be overwhelmed by such things were it not for the third groaning that Paul talks about when he writes that the Spirit comes alongside us and groans. Paul says God groans. This is an unthinkable thought to the philosophical minds of that day. God groans. Jesus groaned. He groaned over the death of his friend Lazarus. He groaned and wept openly over the city of Jerusalem. He groaned as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he groaned most deeply as he hung on the cross. And that is why Paul says, we're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Not because we have trained our minds or mastered our spirits over our circumstances, but because we have a conqueror, the conqueror, who, while we were yet sinners, died for us. And his spirit comes alongside us and groans with us in ways that our words cannot express. And that is why Paul says there's nothing in this world, neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from this great love of God that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why in the expectation gaps of our lives, we can grow and we can have hope. Because hope is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And it's the kind of hope that Paul says will not disappoint. Let's pray together. As I was kind of moving through this message, it was kind of continuing on through what I spoke about with regards to Samuel and jumping to forward into a time, Lord, where you sometimes call us to get up from our morning and to move on. But I felt like I needed to backtrack because there are times in our lives when the expectation gaps of our lives are such that there's nothing left for us to do but mourn for that season of our lives, Lord. But even in the midst of our mourning, Lord, we can have hope. Lord, what Paul wrote to the Romans in a day and age that was so influenced by Greco-Roman thought, where the prevailing thought was that the most important thing was to transcend your circumstances through the power of your reason and your own self-sufficiency, Lord. He wrote that we have someone who has done that 
Lord, and in whom, Lord, we have victory, not because we too have mastered our circumstances, but because he has, and because he has loved us, and he has died for us, even in the midst of our sin, Lord, even in the darkness of our depravity, we have a God, Lord, who sits with us and groans with us in the midst of our expectation gaps, and that's why we have hope, not in ourselves, it's a hope that we know, Lord, will not disappoint. And that's why Paul says there is nothing that will separate us from that, Lord. Sometimes we need to know that in the depths of our expectation gaps, Lord, where we're often left living in despair. And so I pray, Father, that today your spirit might encourage someone's heart here who is living inside of an expectation gap, Lord, that you would give them a sense of the depth of your love, Lord and that there is hope, and that hope, Lord, will not disappoint. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.